This is Sam with California Pacific J-Bugs. For our restoration series beetle today, we're going to be installing a new dashboard along with a bunch of new dash trim accessories to freshen up the dash in our 1969 beetle. A few notes before we get started. Here in our car, as well as many other beetles on the road today, the fresh air box vents and hoses in the trunk have been removed. If the box, vent ducting, and hoses are in place in your car, they will have to be removed to access the back of the dash. As with any project, of course, save all the hardware, parts, and any other miscellaneous pieces that come off until the job is complete. Our dash pad installation starts off a bit easier as a previous owner had removed the dash pad already. The process we go through will be pretty much the same up to installing the dash, as all the steps taken will be the same to get the original dash pad out. Installing a dash pad is a time-consuming job, and there are some tedious steps along the way. Disconnect the negative post of the battery before starting the disassembly of the dash. In the trunk on the back side of the dash, remove the speedometer cable by loosening the nut and pulling it away from the speedometer. Then remove the speedometer by loosening the two Phillips head screws, one on each side, and then twist the speedometer to clear the mounting tabs and move the speedometer back. Be cautious of the wiring, and if any wires have to be removed, Take clear pictures or notes so they can be put back in the proper place. With the speedometer out of the way, remove the trim ring by straightening the four tabs that hold in place to the dash. The dash grills at the left and the right of the speedometer can be removed by straightening the four tabs per grill that hold them in place to the dash. In our case, we have a dash speaker in place, which we won't be reusing, so it will be removed once the grills are off. Our hood release cable was removed by the previous owner, so we do not have to unscrew the bracket from the glove box that holds the handle securely at the side of the glove box. We remove the glove box by removing the screw holding the strap in place at the bottom of the glove box. With the strap unscrewed, the glove box can be pulled away. While we're in the trunk, if your original dash pad is in place, remove the two 10mm nuts at each top corner. And on 1968 through 70 models, remove the two 10mm nuts that hold the dash grab in place as well. Now inside the car, we'll remove the ashtray by pulling it out and pressing on the metal lever at the back of the tray. Under the steering column, remove the two Allen headed bolts holding the column to the dash. Unscrew the headlight, wiper, and emergency flasher knobs from the switches. They are all standard threads, so twist them counterclockwise and remove them. To remove the fresh air knobs, if your car has them, pull the knobs straight off. The knobs have a tension clip to hold them in place to the fresh air control posts, so they pull off and press on. Remove the four Phillips head screws, two at each side, holding the glove box lid to the hinges. Then remove the glove box trim ring by popping off the four plastic rivets. There's two at the top and one on each side. There's three more plastic posts and spring metal clips that hold the trim ring along the bottom side. If the ring is in good shape, you can try and pry off those clips to save the trim ring. However, it's most likely that the rings or the posts will break off. Remove the left and right glove box lid hinges by sliding them out of their mount. We have an aftermarket stereo, which wasn't wired up and we're not going to be reusing, so it's going to be removed. This process can differ from stereo to stereo, but typically involves pulling back two tabs on the steel shroud that houses a stereo. After the stereo is pushed out the back, the shroud itself that's mounted to the dashboard can be removed. If you have an original knob style radio, you can pull off the knobs and remove the nuts, which would hold the radio to the dash. With the radio removed, you can remove the great light warning indicator by pressing both sides of the housing and then pushing it back into the car. There are wires on the back of the switch. Take a picture or make a note about the wiring position so you can reinstall them correctly later. At this point, if the stock dash pad is in place, remove the seven Phillips screws across the bottom and the two screws at the top and the original dash pad can now be removed. If your defroster vents are dried, cracked out, brittle, or need to be replaced, they can be pulled out now as well. And with that, the disassembly is now complete. We start the installation by installing a center, left, and right dash vents, which are popped into place in the openings at the top of the dash. Because the fresh air vent knob assembly and the dash grab handles are not available new, and we have holes in our dash for those, we're going to cap those off. We use two beetle and two bus black door hinge screw caps to cap the holes in the dash pad. And it's easier to install these before the dash is installed than after. The new dash pad is set in place and held with two 10 millimeter nuts which set under the studs at the top corners from the trunk side of the dash. Then back inside the car, install the two Phillips head screws at the top and a seven across the bottom of the dash. Then install the left and right dash grills by pressing the four prongs for each grill through the dash pad and then twist or bend those tabs on the back side of the dash to hold them in place. Install the speedometer trim ring and bend over the four tabs on the back side to hold it in place. Rebolt the steering column back to the dash with the two Allen headed bolts. Then install the headlight, wiper, and emergency flasher knobs by threading them clockwise into their switches. At this point, the fresh air knobs would be pressed straight onto the post if we had them. Press the three wires for the brake light warning switch through the dash and then install those to the warning indicator using the notes you previously made and then push the indicator and shroud back through the dash pad into place. The most difficult portion of the dash pad installation comes at the glove box opening. We use a heat gun to first warm up the plastic and help us to mold the plastic more tightly to the dash opening. 
Then we use spray glue on the back side of the lip of the dash pad and on the metal lip of the opening to hold the lip in place. Then with the lip glued in place, you can use an awl or in our case a Phillips screwdriver to locate and open up the hole in the dash pad for the seven plastic rivets which will hold the glove box trim ring in place. We've got two at the top, one at each side, and three slightly larger rivets across the bottom. The rivets come molded with the pin built into the top of the head. The pin needs to be snapped off the rivet before installing it. With the glove box trim ring in place, press the rivet through the ring, the dash pad, and then the dash sheet metal, and push the pin down with the back edge of a screwdriver. You need to install all seven rivets to hold the glove box trim ring in place to the dash. Now install the left and right glove box hinges through the slot in the trim ring and then slide them into place into the hinge brackets underneath the bottom side of the opening. With the glove box lid slid in place on the hinges and the glove box latch installed, tighten the four Phillips screws. Install the glove box with the strap around it and tighten the mounting screw at the bottom. Then screw the bracket for the hood release cable to the glove box. Install the speedometer and tighten the two Phillips head screws and reinstall any wires that may have been removed using the notes you took earlier. Install the speedometer cable to the back of the speedometer then reconnect the battery, and with that, the padded DAST installation is now complete and definitely much nicer to look at than what we had before.